From the sacred artifacts of ceremonial rituals to the bones and stones of its network of ancient citadels, enchanted forests, magical rainmaking ceremonies, water sprites, and python gods, the spirits of its remote past are deeply embedded in the very fabric of South Africa's Limpopo province. At the confluence of the Sachet and Limpopo rivers, where the borders of South Africa, Botswana and Zimbabwe meet, is the location of one such ancient citadel, Mapungubwe, or Hill of the Jackal, which thrived for many centuries through its accumulated wealth and trade in ivory and gold from the African interior. Three baobab trees known as the Three Sisters look down on the same valley inhabited all those years ago by this industrious, peace-loving community, one that has left behind many remnants of its culture in the ivory chips, glass beads, and fragments of pottery that lay scattered across the landscape. Not too far from this site, the 50-meter-high sandstone Mapungubwe cliff stands out majestically against the stark bushveld. It was here at the top of the hill that the king and his court were accommodated, with the community living in thatched huts in the valley below. The hill is regarded as taboo by many of the locals, who will turn their backs at the mere mention of its name, as they believe it will bring death to anyone who climbs it. Intricately designed artifacts discovered on the hill indicate that this kingdom was the center of a lucrative gold smelting and ivory industry, which crafted copper, gold and ivory objects that were traded for useful objects, among which were beads. Beads were highly valued by African people as ornaments and ritual objects, and thousands of them from Persia, India and China found all over the site, giving an indication not only of their popularity, but also the extent of the trade with the East. Some of the gold artifacts were found buried in the grave of one of the kings. Another great kingdom north of the Limpopo, the Great Zimbabwe, flourished until the 15th century when disruption in trade with the East brought a shift with the Zimbabwean culture back southward, where they settled at a number of sites of which the recently unearthed and rebuilt citadel of Thulamila in Limpopoise, the most famous. The discovery of delicate jewelry, pottery, tools, and other artifacts at Thulamila show that these people were master craftsmen. Two royal graves have been found, the first belonging to a woman of obvious high standing because of the gold bracelets found on her wrist. In the king's grave was found a cranium and a few bones. The citadel is located in a legendary piece of splendor that is today known as the Kruger National Park. This wildlife Eden, two-thirds of which lie in Limpopo, must have been a rich hunting ground for the Thulamila community. Declared a wildlife sanctuary in 1898 by Paul Kruger, it covers an area of almost 2 million hectares, and it was to become one of the largest and most famous wildlife park in the world. The ruins of Thulamela point to a Domba section where young people were initiated into adulthood. The Domba or Python dance lives on to this day with performances by young maidens approaching womanhood. Dancers are joined together, coiling and uncoiling like a python, and creating symbolic patterns to intoxicating rhythms that wind into the night.
According to vendor legend, the first sacred drum brought into the area and used in the Domba ritual is buried in this Baobab forest in the Musina Nature Reserve. There are about 12,000 Baobabs in this reserve, including one of the largest in the country. The water from the Baobab tree is believed to protect one from being eaten by a crocodile, many of which inhabit the sacred lake Fundudzi and are said to have the ability to communicate with the spirit of the ancestors with whom there has been a symbolic link with their leaders for hundreds of years. Beneath the eerie mists drifting across the surface of this strange lake live immortal beings, the Detwain or Shades. They are said to be half human and half invisible, with only one eye, one arm and one leg, and that certain death befalls anyone who sees them. Fundudzi is believed to have been created in ancient times, when a mudslide blocked the course of the Mutali River engulfing entire villages that now lie buried fathoms deep in the lake. What sounds like the shrieks and moans of the victims of this great tragedy have been heard echoing in the surrounding hills. Water has great mystical significance for many of the tribes in this region, with the waterfalls that abound in the higher regions being linked to sacred rituals and water sprites. Coming upon the hauntingly beautiful Dibengani Falls, it is easy to understand how locals believe it to be inhabited by spirits, for this enchanted site has a strange eeriness that overwhelms the senses. In times of drought, the Vendor people send a specially selected member down here to the Papiedi Falls to consult with the waters. He listens very carefully to what the waters are saying and then makes an offering of millet beer from a calabash into the water while praying to his ancestors. And what happens next is quite mystical and magical. The D20, a half-human water spirit, moves up the falls, gathers the beer and swims down to Lake Fonduzi, where the beer slowly, mysteriously, evaporates to form a mist over the sacred forest. The sacred forest, where the bones of the Venda ancestors are buried in shallow graves, in one of whom was Chief Natasha, who loved this forest so much that he came back as a white lion to guard over it. Locals say you can still hear a lion roaring in the dead of night. It is told that in the early 1600s, a princess from the great Karanga Empire in Zimbabwe fled southwards with her followers taking with her the tribe's rain-making medicines. She settled in the Molototsi Valley, founded the Lebedi tribe, and she and her female descendants became known as Modjaji or Rain Queen. The ruins of the part of this first settlement are linked to the Great Zimbabwe. This psychic forest is part of Modjaji's realm standing like prehistoric sentinels above her sacred cave on the mountainside. During times of war, Modjaji and her people would hide in the cave, but as she became known for her rain-making powers, people started to revere her and her enemies diminished. These plants are about 2,000 years old and the air of mystery they exude make you feel that you are most definitely in the realm of the Rain Queen. Today, the rain ceremonies are performed by Queen Mojaji, via descended of the original Mojaji. Although this will never be acknowledged by members of the tribe who believe she neither ages nor loses her beauty, 
but lives untouched by time forever. Her supposed mortality became the inspiration for Ryder Haggard's novel of Queen Ayesha, The She Who Must Be Obeyed. The courtyard where the rain ceremony dancers are performed is sacred. The dancers' feet beat on the earth, under which lies in bed a magical staff. The queen's rain medicines are stored in pots in part of the village where few have access, and the sacred rain plant stands ceremoniously in another corner of the kraal. From the sacred artifacts of ceremonial rituals to the bones and stones of this strange land with its ancient kingdoms, enchanted forests, magical rain-making ceremonies, water sprites and python gods, the spirits of ancient Africa continue to breathe light into this part of the world.